Well, as we continue with applications of quantitative methods, we'll start our study of sampling and estimation. When we're talking about sampling. We're going to take a sample from a population, and we're going to make inferences about the parameters of that population based on the sample. Now, when we talk about a simple random sample, the random part means that every population member, every outcome, has an equal chance of being selected in the sample. Now, when we talk about the sampling distribution, it's the distribution of sample statistics for repeated samples of size n. So what we're talking about there, we've got the distribution of the individual observations. But say we're taking a sample of size 20. And for every sample of size 20, we add them all up and divide by 20. So we get a sample mean. But if we repeatedly grab samples of 20 and calculate the sample mean, we're going to get different values, or at least could get different values each time because each sample is different. Well, when we talk about the sampling distribution, we're talking about the distribution of those sample means around the true mean. And sampling error is simply the difference between the sample statistic, our sample mean, for example, and the true population mean. Now, we talked about random sampling. There's another kind of sampling called stratified random sampling. And the idea of stratified random sampling is to sample from a population, but preserve key characteristics of the population. So we look at subgroups based on these characteristics. So for example, we want to match a, a bond index, but we don't want to buy every bond in the index. There's many reasons we might not want to do that. But we want our sample that we're going to use to have the same characteristics and key aspects as the overall bond index or of the bonds in the index. So some bonds may be callable. Some may be short-term, some may be long-term. Some may be corporate bonds, some may be government bonds. So imagine we've got boxes. And we've got one box for callable corporate bonds, long maturity. And we throw all the bonds from the index in that box. And then we've got another box, non-callable corporate bonds um, that are long-term. And then we've got some short-term corporate bonds. And so we've got all these different boxes based on these characteristics. So when we go to sample, we're going to take random samples from each box. And then for those random samples, for our mat to match the index, we're going to invest the same proportion of the portfolio as the bonds in the box. And we're going to invest that portion in the random sample from the box. So what we've done is we've got a sample, but we've preserved the characteristics of the index, the percentage of callable bonds, the percentage of long-term bonds and short-term bonds, the percentage of corporate bonds and, and, and government bonds are all going to be preserved by this process of stratified random sampling. If we talk about time series data, we're just talking about data over time. So monthly prices for IBM stock for five years, that's time series data. Cross-sectional data is at a point in time or for a period, and it's across, say, multiple firms. So if we looked at returns on all healthcare stocks last month, that would be cross-sectional data. Now, an important part of our sampling and making inferences about the parameters of the population based on our sample is something called the central limit theorem. The central, lim central limit theorem says that for any population that has a mean, call it mu and a variance, sigma squared, as the size of the random sample gets large, the distribution of sample means approaches the normal distribution. And the mean of those sample means is going to have the same mean 
as the distribution, but it's going to have less variance and will decrease the variance of the sample by dividing by n. Excuse me, will decrease the variance of the population by dividing by the sample size n. So the idea here is if I, if I had a uh, barrel of balls and ping pong balls with numbers written on them all, and so there's a mean to that distribution and variance. We don't know what it is. We don't know that it's very, uh, normal. It doesn't have to be normal. And so we've got this distribution of individual values. Well, if I start taking samples of 10 and using the mean of 10, that's going to be a better guess of the mean than just pulling one ball out of there. And if I pulled out samples of 100 and did that repeatedly, those would be even better guesses at the mean of the population because we've got 100 in our sample. And so what this central limit theorem says, as the size of our random samples get large, their distribution approaches a normal distribution, which is important for us in doing our probabilities and confidence intervals. And they're more closely clustered around the true mean. So the variance of that sampling distribution is equal to the variance of the population divided by the sample size. And this is what allows us to make these inferences and confidence intervals based on our standard normal distribution. No matter what the distribution of the population, repeated sampling as the samples get large, that sampling distribution gets very close to a normal distribution. Now we've got a concept here called the standard error of the sample mean. Now, as I said, as we take larger samples, they're better guesses of the mean. They're going to be more closely clustered around it, not as spread out. So we take standard deviation over the square root of the sample size, and we're going to call this our standard error. And if we don't know it, don't know the standard deviation, we'll use the sample standard deviation, S. So before, we said we're going to take variance and divide it by N. Well, if that's our variance of the sampling distribution, and we take the square root of that, then we simply get sigma over the square root of N, our standard error is the standard deviation of these sample means. So let's look at an example. The mean hourly wage for a sample of 30 workers is 1350. And the standard deviation of the population is 290. What's the standard error of the sample mean? Well, if our sample samples a size 30, the standard deviation of those sample means, that is the standard error, is going to be the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of 30. And so our standard error is only 53 cents. So the interpretation for sizes, for samples of size 30, the distribution of the sample means will have a mean of 1350, same as the population, but standard deviation of 53 cents. Now let's look at an example where the mean of the last 30 monthly returns is 2%. And the standard deviation of the sample means for these 30 monthly returns is 20%. What's the standard error of the sample mean? Well, our sample size is 30, so now we take the 20% standard deviation, which we've estimated from the sample, and divide that by the square root of 30 and get 3.6%. And you can see if the sample size is larger, say it was 200 monthly returns. Then we divide by the square root of 200, and our standard error of the sample mean goes down to 1.4%. Now we're going to take a look at uh, the desirable properties of our estimators, our statistical estimates. 
And the first one is unbiased. That is, the expected value is equal to the parameter. Well, if we take a sample, calculate the sample mean, that's an unbiased estimator of the true mean. It may not equal the true mean. It likely won't. But on average, it's distributed around that true mean. So the expected value of the sample mean on average is the mean of the underlying population. So it's an unbiased estimator. An estimator should also, or we'd like it to be, efficient, meaning that the sampling distribution has the smallest various variance of all unbiased estimators. So if we take a sample mean and we have other estimators that are unbiased, we want to choose the one that has the smallest variance. And that's the one we refer to as efficient. And consistency in an estimator refers to the fact that as the sample size gets larger, the estimator gets better. Well, that's clearly true for the sample mean as an estimator of the true mean as well. Double our sample size, we get a better estimate of the true mean. And that was the idea behind our standard error, is that as n got larger, we got closer and closer. Our observations were more clustered around the true mean.